Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this new episode for season three of SageMaker Fridays. My name is Julian, and I'm a dev advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. And once again, please meet my co-presenter. Hi, everyone. My name is Segolen, and I'm a senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. My role is to help customers get the ML project on the right track in order to create business value as fast as possible. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, so as you know, SageMaker Fridays is uh, a bi-monthly event, and we focus on real-life machine learning use cases, which we try to solve using AWS services and Amazon SageMaker. And we try to focus a little bit on the new capabilities that were launched at uh, reInvent just a few months ago. So we are absolutely live. We're in the Paris office. Uh, no slides, um, discussion, and uh, demo only. So please ask all your questions in the chat. Uh, we have uh, friendly moderators to answer all of them. And remember, there are no silly questions. Don't be shy. Make sure you ask all your questions and learn as much as possible. OK? All right, let's get started. We have a very busy episode okay. today. So what is this one about? It? Say it. So uh, two weeks ago, we dived deep into uh, data pre data preparation and feature engineering with SageMaker Data Wrangler. Mm -hmm. We briefly discussed uh, that we could export engineer features to SageMaker yes. Feature Star, mm -hmm. another new capability launch at uh, AWS reInvent in 2020. Yeah. And this is precisely what we are going to discuss in this episode, processing data, mm -hmm. storing features, okay. and re reusing them again and again. OK, fine. Let's get started. Uh, so. We like to focus on real problems, mm -hmm. not on uh, not on services. So, what's the the actual problem, machine learning problem, we're trying to solve today? So today we are going to work on a natural language processing task called sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. Starting from a piece of text, we would like to know if it is if it expresses positive, neutral, or negative sentiment. Okay. We can view this problem as kind of a classification problem with three classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, the predicted output will contain three probabilities. Sure. Ideally, one of these uh, should be uh, much higher than the other two, uh, telling us what is, uh, what is the strongest uh, sentiment. OK, so all right, that's a pretty typical problem. Mm -hmm. How does it relate? to um to actual projects that customers may want to build so um sentiment analysis is a very very popular use case um, in order to uh, understand your customers mm -hmm. for example uh, you could use it to uh, analyze emails uh, social media content mm -hmm. uh, comments on your blog post or uh, analyze your uh, product reviews uh, on your website okay these would let you measure uh, how your uh, customer feel about your product and your service mm -hmm. instead, instant, instantly and at any scale. So these uh, are very, very valuable insights. OK, I, I understand what we're trying to do, but um, don't we have a service for this? <laughs> we have an AI service called Amazon Comprehend, mm -hmm. which is super easy to use. So mm -hmm. are you trying to make me work? on a Friday afternoon for no good reason at all. Oh, Julian, you're <laughs> complaining already. Yes, I am. <laughs> you, you are right about uh, Amazon Comprehend. It does have uh, an API for sentiment analysis. However, um, data scientists uh, may still want to build a model trained on specialized content. This okay. is exactly what we are going to do today, as we are going to train a model on a camera review data set. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, uh, photography has a lot of uh, domain-specific vocabulary, and uh, it is important that our model understands uh, all these nuances. Okay. Amazon Comprehend, of course, lets you train uh, your own test classifier, so we mm -hmm. could definitely give a try to it. Okay. But today, we would like to uh, prefer to have full control uh, over the machine learning process, and uh, we will use our own code uh, instead. 
Okay, okay, makes sense. Um, I'm convinced. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you said this was a classification problem, and mm -hmm. um, you know we've done this quite a few times already in previous episodes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm guessing we're not repeating ourselves. So how is this one different? So you're right. And uh, in a previous episode, uh, we built, for instance, a fraud detection model mm -hmm. based on uh, tabular data okay. in order to classify uh, legitimate uh, transactions and fraudulent ones. Mm -hmm. The huge difference is uh, the huge difference here is that we are working with natural language data, mm -hmm. which yes. is actually some what we call unstructured data. Okay. And uh, we can just throw that data uh, into an XGBoot model and mm -hmm. adding uh, our finger crossing, oh, okay, it, it will work. Okay. Because um, unstructured data and like uh, natural language uh, needs a lot of uh, time consuming uh, processing and engineering, uh, especially since uh, natural language data sets are usually quite large. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Also, uh, each algorithm usually requires a specific uh, input formats. So, uh, chunks are, uh, we will have to process the same data set in different ways during the course of the project. Okay, yeah. So, I, I see why we'd want to do the feature engineering once and then store the features instead of computing mm -hmm. again and again. Mm -hmm. So, of, co of course, once we've stored them, we can share them with other team members exactly. or maybe other teams inside the company and save even more time for everybody. So you mentioned algorithm, so I guess we're not using XGBoost today. <laughs> no. uh, what are we using? <laughs> so uh, we, could definitely, we could definitely go uh, with uh, deep learning, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even use advanced model for uh, natural language processing, such as the uh, Yugin uh, face uh, transformer models. Ah, yes. Maybe we will do that okay. in a future episode, who knows? But uh, as you know, it is important to try the simple Thing yeah, yeah. I've told you a hundred <laughs> times, try the simple things first. I always vote for simple. So what's a reasonable first step today? So uh, we are going to use a building algorithm in SageMaker called a blazing test. Oh, I love this one. Ah, yes, <laughs> definitely. So blazing test uh, has been invented by Amazon. And uh, as the name implies, blazing, uh, it scales uh, very well thanks to uh, GPU training. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's going to provide a highly optimized uh, implementation of the work to wave uh, work to wave algorithm and text classification algorithm. Mm -hmm. The input format uh, for training data is also very simple. Yes, as we'll see. So, oh. uh, as it is compatible with the uh, popular fast text, fast text algorithm. So, uh, that's what we are going today. Okay. It's today to use. Yeah. All right. So, I think. It's starting to make sense. Uh, so I guess the game today is to start from unstructured data, mm -hmm. camera reviews, transform uh, that data set into something that Blazing Text can yeah. understand, understand and train on, mm -hmm. uh, store it someplace uh, where we can use it again mm -hmm. and again uh, for model training and prediction, right? Okay, Perfect. so let's take a look at the data set. So, uh, what data set are we using today? So, um, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we would like to build a model specialized for uh, camera reviews. Okay. For this purpose, we are going to use the Amazon Custer, uh, Customer Reviews uh, data set okay. hosted on uh, AWS. Okay, pretty cool. So, real reviews from real Amazon customers. <laughs> yes. Um, How big is it? <laughs> oh, it's included over 1,300 million Amazon customer reviews, okay. broken down by uh, product categories. Okay. Data is available in, in a TSV format and or in parquet format as well. Okay. Oh, parquet. Okay, good. Yeah, we can yeah, do parquet. yeah, parquet. All right. 130 million, I think we can do that. So let's share my screen, please, and, uh, and we can start looking at the data set and exploring it. So... Um, this is the uh, home page, so to speak, for the Amazon Customer Reviews dataset. It's uh, hosted in S3, as you would expect. And uh, you can uh, find a list of all files. So either you get the full dataset or you get the dataset broken down into categories. Um, but we don't really want to look at CSV files. So you know what? We're going to load this dataset in Amazon Athena and try to see what, what this thing is. So switching to Athena, uh, the first thing I would do, and let me zoom in a little bit, 
um, the first thing you would do is to create uh, an external table mm -hmm. based on the parquet files in S3. Okay, so don't worry that uh, create statement is uh, on, on the page I just show you, so you don't need to uh, write this yourself, right? Create the table, and then you run that MSK repair table, which basically, even though it says repair, is going to load the partition data mm. into the table we create. Okay, and now we see, right? Uh, we have this table here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I've done this uh, previously. It's in the Athena test uh, database. And of course we can run some reviews, right? Uh, we can run some queries, sorry. <laughs> so let's look maybe at the different categories available there. Okay, so run the distinct uh, on product categories. And we see pretty much all the stuff that's on sale, uh, that's for sale on Amazon.com, right? So uh, video games, baby products, beauty products, automotive, and yes, camera, right? Yeah. So we're interested in camera reviews. So we could say, all right, camera reviews, show me camera reviews then, right? What does this look like? What was this? Okay, so we see pretty much what we would expect. Mm -hmm. Customer IDs, review IDs, product IDs, uh, product title, mm -hmm. star rating, right, from one to five, uh, votes, review headline, review body, right? Well, pretty much what you see, right? Uh, the date, the year, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we only have cameras here, right? So pretty cool. We have a lot of those. Actually, we could count how many we have. So we have a little more than 1.8 million camera reviews. So I'm guessing that's enough, right? <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, that's enough for our purpose. Um, we could look at how many different items we have. And can you tell I'm madly in love with Athena? <laughs> One of my favorite AWS services. So we have 168,000 something uh, cameras here, okay? Mm -hmm. And we could do more, but we'll get to that later on, okay? Um, so you can see Athena makes it super easy to explore that data. Um, but remember last week we talked about uh, SageMaker capability called Data the Wrangler, Wrangler, right? <laughs> so why don't we try and load this stuff in Wrangler? So I'm jumping to SageMaker Studio now. Okay, and if you remember last week, mm -hmm. uh, we saw that you could import mm -hmm. from uh, from Athena. So let's do that. Okay, select the database, and here I just need to provide a SQL query that's going to select. So I'm just going to go back here, and we're going to take only the camera review. So let's remove the limit. <laughs> And we can run this, okay? So we should see a preview right Where? here, right? Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, so we see exactly the same thing and confirm that this is what we want and we can import the data set and let's call this call Amazon reviews camera. Okay, so now it's imported. Mm -mm. Right. So we're not going to do the data wrangler episode. Again? That's last week. <laughs> Go and see that one. Uh, let's just do a quick analysis on this one. And why not build a histogram for star ratings? Right. Uh, so let's wait for a second for a uh, wrangler to uh, fetch column names. Uh, take a second. And we're going to build a histogram with uh, stars and stars, uh, star ratings. Right. So we can count them. Uh, so, uh, in case you're uh, wondering, um, Data Wrangler is not loading the 1.8 million reviews, right? Uh, it's actually sampling the table, and I think it's uh, I think it's loading 50,000, right? So let's just say, all right, I want to do uh, star rating, all right. and yeah, that's yeah. It. and yeah, just preview, um, and we should see histogram. Okay. Right, so we have lots of five-star products because mm -mm. it's Amazon, right? <laughs> of course, uh, and we see uh, a distribution here. So, okay, just a quick review of what we've done on Data Wrangler last week. Uh, and I guess we could start doing some feature engineering here, mm -hmm. but 
as Sego told us, we want to be fully in control. We want to do uh, proper machine learning and we want to write code, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right. So <laughs> I'm not going to spend too much time on Data Wrangler. Let's uh, close it. And we're going to move to feature engineering, okay? Uh, so the first step would be load the data set, mm -hmm. right? Of course. So there are different ways to do this. Of course, we could copy a file from S3 mm -hmm. and load it, mm -hmm. but it's it's cheap, right? <laughs> and we're not cheap. <laughs> we are not cheap. The cooler option is to load from the CSV file that's automatically created when you run a CDAC query. Okay, let me show you how to do this. So. Uh, when you're in Athena, if you go to um, is it settings, yes, you can specify a location for your query outputs, okay, which I've already done. So anytime now you run a query, you're going to find uh, CSV files in there, right, organized by day. So those CSV files are like the actual output. Of the query. And if you're wondering which one to pick, you can go in the query history mm. and you see here, click on this, you get the query ID, right? Which is what you need to look for to get results. Okay. All right. So we could do this. Um, and there's a third way, which we'll discuss later, right? <laughs> so either way, now we've loaded our data, okay? So what are we doing? Dropping mm -hmm. uh, any line with null values, right? Which is reasonable. Mm -hmm. 1.8 million, I think we can afford to, <laughs> to, to, clean it to waste, yeah, to yeah, waste yeah, a, yeah. Few, a few uh, uh, reviews if we need to. Uh, so we see 1.8 million, 16 columns, mm -hmm. and this is what they look like. We've seen this already, right? Mm -hmm. No big surprise. So one thing I'm going to do is uh, the, the text here uh, is pretty much the, a headline and a body, mm -mm. right? So to keep it simple, I'm going to merge them, mm -hmm. right? You could say, well, maybe the title has more importance and you need to build a more clever model, but I don't do that. I do, <laughs> I do silly ones, right? <laughs> she does the clever ones. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm just uh, going to put those two things together and I'm going to keep uh, only four columns, mm -hmm. the review ID, uh, the product ID, the star rating, and the review body that I just created. Okay, so we'll see why we need those things later on. Later on. Okay, so this is what the, the data looks like. Now, remember, we need Blazing Text. Right? Tell us a little bit about the label that Blazing Text needs. It doesn't work with one, two, three, four, five, right? <laughs> No, no, so Blazing Text uh, training format, the algo expect a single preprocessed pre -processed, uh, text file uh, uh -huh. with space separated uh, token. Yeah, you can see it here. That's, these are examples. Exactly. Yeah, a yeah. text label that actually says label and then the, those weird looking sentences. Why do we have all those spaces? Explain that to me. <laughs> <laughs> so and not just me, to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the tokenization okay. uh, regarding um, the case of uh, NLP. So remember that we, what we said at the beginning of the, <laughs> the episode is that uh, the text data are uh, unstructured data. Yes. So uh, in order to work with them, you need to clean and structure them uh, in order to apply later uh, NLP uh, techniques. Okay. Tokenization is really a key concept uh, in NLP uh -huh. uh, and one of the most common preprocessing tasks uh, when you work with text. Okay. Tokenizer will divide strings into a list of uh, substrings uh -huh. and, or uh, in other words, will split sentences or document into smaller tokens. Okay, which we see here, right? Exactly. So we have word, each word, and, and even punctuation and signs. Even punctuation, exactly. Are uh, number. space separated exactly. and numbers, and it's, it's okay, one thing and you know one thing only, and then spaces around it. Exactly, okay. and thanks to this to delimit everything. Exactly, yeah. and it will help you, for instance, to uh, identify the words of interest uh, within a string uh, of characters. So okay. it's really important. Okay, so basically we're telling the algo where each word and each side is. So I understand that. Now, obviously, our if we look at our text um, here, it doesn't look like that, right? 
punctuation signs are mm -hmm. next to words and et cetera, et cetera. So tell me we're not going to write any code, <laughs> no. this, right? <laughs> No, no, no. We don't need. We definitely don't need to do that. Um, and uh, we can because we can use uh, nice open source libraries ah, like yeah, okay. uh, NLTK yes. or Spacey. Nice. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, NLTK, which means uh, Natural Language uh, Toolkit, was uh, originally originally created in uh, 20 years ago, I think, uh -huh. uh, in the Department of um, Computer and Information Science at the U University of Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, it is a suite of uh, Python libraries uh, providing modules for uh, the main language processing task, okay. like the tokenization. All right, and we're going to use it, sure. Sure. And after, um, the, um, you've got as well the possibility to use uh, Spacey, uh, Spacey sorry, mm -hmm. uh, which is another popular uh, open source library for uh, advanced uh, natural language processing, um, providing software for okay. production usage. All right, we'll look at both. Um, we love open source. And so, okay, so we need to get rid of those one, two, three, four, five um, mm -hmm. uh, integers, uh, star ratings, because we want text labels. So. Here I've decided to go with three uh, mm -hmm. classes, right? So negative sentiment, neutral sentiment, positive sentiment. So one and two stars are negative, three is neutral, four and five is positive. Mm -hmm. But you could have five if you really want to. Mm -hmm. You could have, you know, very negative, negative, neutral, positive, very, very positive. positive. I mean, you'll get the notebook, right? Don't worry. So you can go and, and tweak. So I'm using this uh, really cool API in Pandas called Map to replace um, to replace the uh, uh, integers uh, with a new column, right? Called label, and uh, and that's what it looks like now. Okay, mm -hmm. so now we tokenize, right? Uh, and it's not scary at all. Uh, we use NLTK, like you said, import NLTK. Uh, we download uh, an NLTK module called Punkt, uh, which means point in Germany, in German, I should say. <laughs> so maybe it's a German developer. I don't know, but anyway, it's a really cool uh, dunk cushion for this. Dunk right? cushion because it's a great one. <laughs> it's a good one, <laughs> and uh, we can apply tokenization to our uh, review body column just like that. Uh, you notice here it takes 17 minutes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, remember, we have 1.8 million, million rows. Okay. So I'm always a little bit nervous to run uh, very long cells in a Jupyter notebook. Mm -hmm. Because first, you know, it can always, you know, it can always fail in bizarre ways, uh, and and second, you know, it stops me from getting anything else done. So we'll we'll, we'll leave it at that for now, but don't worry. We'll, yeah, yeah, we'll, we, we'll do back. better in a few minutes. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so 17 minutes, and uh, then we just so tokenization will, as you said, split the sentences and return an array of tokens. Mm -hmm. So we have to join them again. We don't want an array, we want a string, mm -hmm. and, uh, but space separated string, right? So we join those things again, and now it looks like that, right? And we can see if you zoom in a bit more, yeah, you can see here we have spaces after and before punctuation, so it's all good, okay? So, um, so now we could continue train, but remember I said there was a third option? There's always more, right? <laughs> and yeah, now we're awesome. Because what we really want to do, instead of waiting for 17 minutes here, is we want to offload that mm -hmm. to a SageMaker processing job. Okay, and SageMaker processing is another service that I love <laughs> because you can just throw everything away, run that stuff in in a different notebook, and continue experimenting. So we've covered sage maker processing again and again and again. again and I and say, again, oh, actually, again. Tony, sage maker processing again. And I said, yes, yes. <laughs> again. And, and you will see it in future episodes because I think it's a great capability. <laughs> so how do we do this? So we've seen this just a, we've seen this many times, just a quick recap. So what I'm doing basically is I'm moving my, you can see here, mm -hmm. I'm moving my pre-processing code to a Python script, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, which is exactly what you saw in the notebook, except I decided that you could choose between NLTK and Spacey, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. And we'll see why <laughs> in a second. Um, and 
just put your code in the script and the only stuff you need to add is first you need to receive characters and arguments as command line, command line arguments mm -hmm. that's how SageMaker processing will uh, pass them to your code okay uh, you need to read uh, the data set from a well-known place and you need to save the results in a well-known place uh, speaking of which here i'm actually saving two files i'm saving uh, a, a final blazing text data set, which we could use exactly like that mm -hmm. and train. And I'm also saving kind of an intermediate intermediate shape because of course we're going to push this stuff to feature store. Okay, so this is why we have two outputs here. Okay, so this is my code. And then I just need to run that stuff uh, in SageMaker processing. And what it really means is I create it's a scalar and processor, and I run it, uh, passing the location of my input data and uh, and defining my outputs and passing my parameters. So here I'm using Spacey, and this runs for a little bit, right? I can see Spacey being installed, Spacey running, and the, the, the complete job ran for nine minutes, okay. which means the Spacey bit probably run for four or five minutes, mm -hmm. right? So Spacey is much faster than NLTK. No offense to NLTK, it's brilliant. Uh, but if you're looking for performance, uh, Go for Spacey is fast, right? Mm -hmm. And you know why? Yes. <laughs> All right, tell us why. <laughs> no, because Spacey is based on Python, yes. the C language extension for Python. And there you go. You cannot beat C, right? No, the old no. guy, the old <laughs> C developer speaking to you today loves this, right? So more power to C. And uh, and there you go, right? Um, Sage Micro Processing, you can run different versions. You can uh, just get this long running steps out of your mm -hmm. notebook and run them programmatically again and again and again. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we get an output. Uh, we saw the output here. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, I guess we should take a look. So do I have a terminal here? Yes. Okay. So let's see what this looks like. Okay, so I get my, uh, and you know what, let's, Let's copy and open those files. We have time. Right? We said we would do more live stuff around where it's live within the live thing. So crazy. Okay. So um, if we look at the blazing text data, it looks Exactly what we want. Like, like it should, right? So the label, label thing, and mm -hmm. and the text, and it's nicely separated. Good format. Yes. <laughs> and that. What about that TSV file? So what's in there? So we see the four columns or five mm -hmm. columns, right? The review ID, product ID, star rating, review body, and label. Mm -hmm. Okay, because we're going to push those features to feature store. So that's why I want to keep them. Okay. All right, back to this. So we use the awesome option three, <laughs> which is we load data processed by our fancy processing job, right? So we just load directly into pandas, close this thing here. And we see exactly what we saw in the TSV file. And now we can move on to feature group, okay? So we need to set up uh, a, a client for uh, for feature store, and this is very generic code. You can just copy copy exactly from this, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what we're going to use to invoke feature store APIs. Okay. Okay. So obviously we need to uh, define a name for the feature group, mm -hmm. right? So uh, let's call it Amazon Reviews Feature Group with a unique timestamp. Um, and now we get to the important stuff. So let me show you the data again, right? Now you will understand why we kept mm. that review ID thing. So 
let's explain what a feature group is. So a feature group mm -hmm. is uh, is a, an object mm -hmm. that stores records. Mm -hmm. Okay, and those records represent the processed rows mm -hmm. from the original data set. Okay, mm -hmm. so those each row in the CS file mm -hmm. or CSV file mm -hmm. uh, or the Parquet file becomes has been processed by uh, our script mm -hmm. and becomes uh, a record in mm -hmm. the feature group. Okay. okay, so it's just vocabulary, right? If you want to call them rows, it's okay. So, <laughs> so just like a row in the original data set has uh, columns mm -hmm. and values mm -hmm. in, inside the columns, a record has key value pairs. Okay. Okay. So for example, uh, in each record for um, this uh, this data, we'll have a review ID key, a review ID, a product ID key, uh, a star rating key, etc., and individual values. Okay. And of course, you see where I'm getting at because if you have key values, then you need some kind of unique identifier to say, give me the value for the product ID key for record block. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course, this unique identifier is going to be review ID. Okay. okay. So this is a really important concept. When you create your feature groups, you need to come up with a unique identifier Definitely. that you can use to uh, grab records and read features. Okay. So in our case, it's super simple. We have this review ID thing. It's unique and we're using that. If we pull data from a, a relational database, we could use a primary key mm -hmm. or something unique. Okay. All right, so that's what we do here. Uh, we say, hey, the record ID uh, name mm -hmm. is going to be review ID, right? Okay. Now there's a second column we need, and it's uh, it's a column to store timestamps. Mm -hmm. So we'll see at the at the at the end of the uh, session what we can use those timestamps for. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're just going to say, hey, okay, cre please create a new column. It's called even time. And please fill it with whatever timestamp is now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you can easily do this with the assign API in Pandas, right? Create a new column and assign a unique value to it, a single value to it. Okay. So once we've done this, this is what the data looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we created the new column with the timestamp. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's the same timestamp because uh, I've done all of that uh, in the same uh, run, so to speak. Make sense? Makes sense. All right. Not, not too difficult. And maybe in your data, you already have some kind of timestamp. It's just I hear we didn't have that. Okay. All right. So we're going to ingest this uh, into feature store. So data types are also going to be important. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have two options. Uh, you can define a very nice JSON dictionary, uh, <laughs> which is called feature definitions, and pass it to the uh, feature group create API. Um, who loves JSON? Not me. No? No. Anyone? <laughs> OK, no one here, right? Uh, so we're not going to do that. Um, the second option is to just make sure your pandas columns have the right type and mm -hmm. let feature store infer yeah. data types. And this is much uh, easier for me, right? So I'm just making sure all my columns have the proper type. And that's it, right? Okay. Uh, the only weirdness, so to speak, that kind of threw, threw me off guard is the event time needs to be float 64, okay. even though you know, it's not really float, but OK. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you use anything else, it's going to complain when you ingest. So <laughs> remember, the event time should be float 64. Floats. We could also use the Unix uh, time and date format, so it's a um, string you mm -hmm. know, with a, a date and a time. And, uh, and of course, we'd set the type to string if we did that. OK, so we load the feature definitions from the data frame. We can see it's all good. And now we can actually create the group. And it's it's pretty simple. So features will be stored uh, offline, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which means in S3, okay. right? So you need to pass an S3 location. We pass the unique ID mm -hmm. or uh, records. We pass the uh, timestamp name, uh, the Sage Maker role. Uh, we can also store them online. Uh, which uh, we'll use again at the at the end of the demo, so that we can query, we oh. can put and get and delete individual features with a very simple API. So that's useful. We could use this API actually at prediction time oh. to inject features into 
action request with low latency, so pretty good. Uh, a description, and you should absolutely uh, fill this because that's how people will find the feature groups that you created and tags, again, to explain what you're doing because one of the key things in SageMaker feature group is you want to share the features, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. So if you don't put any information, it's just going to have a just going to have a name uh, okay. and it's not very clear, right? Uh, and actually, uh, once we've created it, we can see it in Studio, and it looks like this, right? Cool. Okay, so we see the description. We can double click on this. Yeah, we can see the description, all the all the parameters. Uh, we can see feature definitions. We can see tags. We can add more tags. So Please, you know, make sure you fill all that stuff because it's, and you can even click on this thing, which is very cool. Oh, oh yes. Oh, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> Eye candy. Uh, and we can see uh, very quickly, okay, what, what is this uh, feature group and, you know, am I interested in it or not? Okay. So tags are great and you should use them here as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so creating, uh, let me close this. Creating the the group is just create, right? Mm -hmm. Create API. Uh, we have to wait for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, here's where I'm going to complain. So uh, Boto3 has this cool mechanism called waiters. So uh, you, you have an API to wait for some resource to be ready, some AWS resource to be ready. There isn't uh, any waiter for a feature store. So I've created an issue on uh, on GitHub, and I would very much appreciate it if you could say, "Yeah, That's we need right. this. Yeah, we need this." So all of you go now to this and say, "Yes, we need it." Thank you. <laughs> right? And the Boto three maintainers will hate me for this. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, we can just you know write a silly loop to wait for the group to be ready. But come on, we 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 would love to have uh, a waiter, please. Okay, and then we run this. Uh, ingest api mm -hmm. okay so we could store individual records i would see we could call put record mm -hmm. um which is very similar to what you would do with dynamodb for example oh, okay. so put an individual record i'll show you how to do this later uh, but here we want to bulk ingest right so just load those 1.8 million things into feature group and you can do this passing the data frame and uh, a number of workers, right? So 64 is probably too much, <laughs> uh, but I guess I had to try it. So it's probably more reasonable to do four or something like that. And you can make this uh, synchronous or synchronous operation. Okay. So after a little while, right? Because it's a, it's a ra rather large data set. We have this stuff in the offline store. Mm -mm. And well, the next uh, cell kind of, kind of gives it away. How are we going to query this? Mm -hmm. We're going to use Athena. Athena. Okay, so we're going to go back to Athena. Again. <laughs> yep. Okay, so let's go back to queries. And okay, now I see if I move to SageMaker, the SageMaker feature store database, mm -hmm. I see this table, right? So if I preview it, aha, uh -huh. <laughs> this is the equivalent data that I, we just ingested, right? And it has some extra columns at the end, but hey, we'll, we'll pretend we didn't see those for now, okay? <laughs> so of course we can uh, we can query that, okay? Uh, and you could say, for example, let's find the cameras with the largest number of, of, of reviews and their average rating. Okay, so standard SQL uh, that we're running on this table that was created in the feature store. So let's run this query. Okay, and we can see, right, pretty much uh, the, the most popular items and their ratings. Okay. Um, so now we could say find cameras that have at least 1,000 reviews. And the reason for this is you know, maybe I want to build uh, a specific model for my best selling cameras, mm -hmm. right? Maybe I want to do that. So I've done all the feature engineering work already. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why would I do that again and again? It's there, it's stored. Now I can query and say, okay, I'm going to pull some data, some engineered data, and build my data set from that. 
okay? And we can say, all right, let's find, you know, we can find reviews or um, cameras that have at least 1,000 uh, reviews, right? And mm -hmm. if we run this, let's see what we get. All right. Aha! <laughs> Magic. Beautiful. We see exactly what blazing text would need. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Right. So here it's just the two columns because I selected the two columns. Right. <laughs> so this is just an example here. Uh, but imagine this this is a little bit different from how we usually do things where usually mm. we would you know we'd have a csv file and say ah, okay maybe we want to keep only the rows so we process that and save it again to csv and then maybe load that somewhere and train on it and then we'd say ah, okay now i now want to train maybe on a different subset okay mm. so let's run feature engineering again on a different subset which honestly it tends to be a waste of time right mm -hmm. if you do that again and again so here, I think it's, you know, uh, it's probably, you know, better option to just process everything, and dump sure. it in in, uh, in the offline store, and then say, okay, that's done. And other people could be working on that, mm -hmm. right? You could be training a, a model for, I don't know, you know, uh, mid-priced, mm -hmm. uh, portable, you know, whatever. And and we would work on the same feature store. And and we wouldn't have to run any any additional processing because it's already done. It's great, right? Right. And we can very easily query with the Tina, uh, Fina and, and find what, okay? So fine. And this is exactly how I've done it. I mean, I've written my queries in Athena because it's so friendly. And and now I say, okay, this is what I want. Okay, the the reviews for the uh, cameras that have at least thousand reviews. Okay. And I could say, all right, I can take this query and go back to my notebook. And I could just copy paste that query um, and uh, and run it from Python, from my notebook in Athena, right? So yeah, just find the table name for, for the feature group, which is this. And these are the same queries you just saw, okay? And this is the final one, the one that extracts labeled reviews for the cameras with at least a thousand reviews. Okay, you can see it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You just have to pay attention to, you know, escaping mm -mm. characters. Uh, <laughs> so that's why you see quotes here because, um, yeah, because we have characters in in the, uh, we have dots and we have mm -hmm. you know characters in the table name that could be uh, messing with Python. So we need to be careful here, but that's about it, okay? And so we see the query, we run this, right, uh, on Athena, and we get the result in a data frame, which is very nice. And this is exactly what we want, okay? And we have 82,000 something reviews, right? And a lot of them are positive, as we saw, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that data set is, uh, is biased towards positive reviews. Uh, I guess our customers are too nice, right? <laughs> Uh, we have a few negative and a few Should neutral. Be. So you could say, well, it's imbalanced. Uh, yeah. Okay, it's it's a little bit imbalanced. Uh, it's not severe imbalance, but it's probably something we would want to fix. So maybe we would remove some positive reviews, do some sampling. Understood. We're not going to do that today, but something to uh, keep in mind. Time. We're going to split our training and validation. As usual. Yes, 90%, 10% which is a good, good ratio in this case, yeah. yeah, yeah. Save to TXT files. Uh, and again, you know, just to reassure ourselves, this is exactly what we want, right? <laughs> this is what the doc says, underscore, underscore, label, underscore, underscore, something, <laughs> and then token again, again, again. Yes, I'm gonna, not gonna check all of it, but it looks good to me. <laughs> Okay, and and honestly, we could, uh, we could leave you now and go have a drink or a beer or something because the rest is, and I'm gonna say my favorite sentence. And we agreed uh, with Sego, I'm gonna have a t-shirt made with this. It's Sage make your business as usual. <laughs> yeah, you can start making fun of me. That's okay, it's in my job desk. And it is really Sage make your business as usual because, uh, well, we're uploading the data to S3. We're grabbing the container of blazing text, creating a SageMaker estimator. Mm -hmm. 
I'm training on GPU here because um, it's bla the blazing text, as you said, uh, is compatible with fast text. Mm -hmm. But the key thing is blazing text actually runs on GPU, mm -hmm. right? And it can run on multiple GPUs when it's used in uh, word to vec mode. Yeah, I think in in, uh, in classification mode like here, it can only run on single GPU, but it, it's it's quite fast indeed. So we only set the um, one mandatory hyperparameter, which is supervised mode, which means text classification. Mm -hmm. Again, unsupervised is word to vec uh, word vectors. Uh, we define the training channel, the validation channel, and we call fit. Right? We've seen this a million times. Okay. Uh, so we have six million words. Uh, we have 15k something uh, unique words. Mm -hmm. Our vocabulary size is 15k. And we train at 31 million words per second. So you, you, you could say, yeah, is that fast? Yes, it's fast. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's, fast. it's quite fast. <laughs> and, and the funny thing is this, right? The, the actual training time of the algo is one second. So Blazing Text yeah. learned those uh, 82,000 reviews in just one second. Blazing. Yeah, it's blazing, fast. it's blazing fast. And validation accuracy is not too bad. It's ninety. It's over ninety-one percent, which is pretty cool. Given that I've only done very basic feature engineering, mm -mm. I haven't touched any of the hyperparameters. Mm -mm. Uh, we could do hyperparameter tuning and get a better, even better accuracy. But that's already pretty good, yeah, right? Definitely. Yes. So we can deploy, wait for a few minutes, and now we can test, right? So. Uh, here, here are three examples. I really love this camera. It takes amazing pictures. Sounds positive to me. Uh, this camera is okay. It gets the job done. Nothing fancy. And the third one is poor quality. The camera stopped working after a couple of days. Right? <laughs> Add your favorite profanity. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I wrote those. Right? Um, I wrote those myself. So you can see how imaginative I am. Now, if we run those three in, uh, samples on mm -hmm. the model calling the predict API again, SageMaker business as usual. We can see the first one is super positive. The second one is mixed mm -hmm. as it should be, right? It's it, it's equally positive and neutral, right? And you could say, yeah, I mean, the, that customer is is not unhappy, mm -hmm. but they're not thrilled, okay? They're, it's like, okay, fine. Okay. It's not negative. It's not negative. It's, it's, it's okay, could be better, I guess. And the last one is strongly negative as it should, cool. right? Cool. So <laughs> this model works, right? So don't forget to clean up, delete the endpoint, delete the feature group, and this is how you remove all feature groups and they just go, everything goes away, right? So uh, summing things up, I think if you use the offline store, like mm -hmm. this, uh, you can build data sets on the fly using standard SQL. Mm -hmm which is nice. I mean, uh, yeah. I find it much easier to query SQL, uh, to query SQL, uh, to, to build data set than to write complex pandas or PySpark stuff. So it's just me, right? You may think, no, I hate SQL. I love, I want to do PySpark instead. And that's great. You, you can do that. But uh, I think for, for uh, maybe, you know, business analysts, people who are not software engineers, it's a great capability that you can build and extract data using SQL. Everybody knows SQL, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody should know SQL. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's and all the tools work with you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can use your favorite SQL tools, whatever you like. It, it's great. It's it's a good way to build data sets, right? And share them. Okay, uh, there's one more thing, right? Uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, fine. Remember timestamps. Ah, timestamps. <laughs> okay. Yeah, nothing here deals with that. Time stamp, so, no, no, okay. No. What about the timestamp? <laughs> um, so we saw that each individual record mm -hmm. has a timestamp that we create uh, when we put the record in the store. Uh, so let me show you that API. And here it is. Okay, so it starts the same, uh, create a feature store client and access the feature group. Okay, so exact same thing as before. Now I could say, okay, I wanna see one individual record. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here I'm using the unique ID, mm -hmm. right? 
and I'm calling the get record API to get to fetch the full record. Uh, optionally, you can pass feature names. So if you only want the review body you could, or, or the label, you could just get that. Okay. okay. So here I'm getting the full record. And remember I said key value pairs. Well, this is what we see here, right? Mm -mm. So it's an array of uh, key value pairs, pretty much, right? And we see, of course, the timestamp. So you can get those values, you can retrieve them. Like I said, here it's not uh, it's not a good example of that, but imagine you had uh, very complex features that you created, you know, transforming you know, raw data into some complex feature for you know, whatever life sciences mm -hmm. or something like that. And you do, and and you would want to use that at prediction time, right? So you know, maybe you get you know you get a molecule name in the <laughs> prediction request, and you don't want to use the molecule name. You want to use the molecule property, mm. blah, blah blah blah. That's that you computed in the feature store. You could you could do that. You could say, okay, get record for molecule name, blah blah and retrieve the complex features that took two weeks to engineer and inject them in your prediction request. And it would just take a few milliseconds to retrieve, mm -hmm. okay? So again, this data set is not a good example of that, but this is one way you could use mm -hmm. the online store, okay? I'm sure we'll show that uh, in another episode. Maybe not with molecules, because <laughs> I'm not really a chemist. Oh, we should add, uh, we should call my friend uh, Francesco. He's the, he's the chemist. Uh, okay. So obviously we can add new records. Mm -hmm. So let's say this particular customer decides to update their reviews, right? So initially they gave a five star rating to the product and then they go and say, no, nah, actually it's four. It's four, so you it's sound great. Okay, so so somewhere in your data, you know, you see, well, it, it's now four and you want to ingest this again, mm -hmm. and you want to update the feature to four. So you could say, okay, that's fine. I'm gonna grab that review, um, and uh, and I'm gonna change the star rating to four, mm -hmm. and I'm going to update even time to now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The new time for this update. Okay. So now my record looks like okay, it's a four, and the timestamp has changed. Um. Okay, and I put the record back into the into the store. Mm -hmm. Okay, super simple. Right now, if I get that record again, well, no surprise. Okay, I see the star rating is a four, and the timestamp is whatever timestamp I have for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you when you up you update a record, so to speak, um, and you get it again, obviously you're going to get the latest version, which is what you want, right? Mm -hmm which is what you want. If you update your features for prediction, you don't want to get the old stuff, you want the, the up-to-date stuff, right? Now, these updates actually go to the offline store, mm. okay? And so this is, so which is great because you don't want any discrepancy. You want the same features at prediction time and training time, okay? Um, so you just need to wait for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, not, uh, it's not instantaneous. You need to wait for a few minutes for the off online changes to propagate to offline. So now, if I query the feature store, the offline store again, for that record identifier, mm -hmm. okay, right? I see two records, Brilliant. okay? Uh, I see the initial one mm -hmm. and I see the new one, okay? And it's the same ID, so, Although you may want to use a primary key for this, mm -hmm. the behavior is not the behavior of a primary key. You can have duplicate, uh, duplicated entries for your records. And you could say, oh, that's awful, but absolutely not. It's mm -hmm. exactly what we want because we can keep track of the different versions, right, mm -hmm. uh, of, of our features, okay? And remember, when we get, uh, when we get the record, we'll get the latest one. So there's no, we, I mean, it's deterministic. We know what we're going to get, the latest one, okay? And of course, the main application for this is we can time travel, okay? So we can query the feature store, the offline feature store, and say, show me my features at this point in time, right? So 
a lot of people have issues with you know versioning data sets and and keeping track of the different uh, iterations. Well, here's how you could do it, right? You could say, well, show me my data as of you know uh, an hour ago, two hours ago, etc. And the only thing you would do is just you know use the uh, the event time to uh, to do that, right? Say, so show me this thing Great. before time, whatever. Okay. Really cool. Okay. So here, for example, I would just I could go back to the initial version of my feature. Okay. So this is a very simple way to manage different feature versions. Now, we saw this extra column here called called is deleted. So, of course, there's the delete API, which is what you would think. Delete pass the record identifier and an event time that will be stored, mm -hmm. okay? So if I delete uh, this record and I get it again, I get an empty response, okay? So that record is gone from the offline store, uh, the online store, excuse me, the <laughs> online store, okay? Which again is what we want because we could say, oh, these features are obsolete or buggy or, mm -hmm. and I, I want to make sure they never get used for prediction, prediction. right? And they should be ignored. They should be unavailable for prediction. So here, if I get um, this record ID and try to eject it into a prediction request, you know, things aren't going to fail because it's gone. But, and that's the last thing I want to show you today, if we query the offline store again, now we see three events three versions of the event. We see the original one, star rating five. We see the updated one, star rating four. And we see an empty one, right, which has none values, the timestamp that we passed, That's and true. is deleted to true. Okay, and this is called a, a tombstone record and because it, it kind of seals, you know, it seals that record. Okay, as long as we have this um, 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 more recent deleted event, the store will never be able to grab those online. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can still query them offline, and we could say uh, we want to use those for training sets or just for historical purposes, yeah, uh, or just you know for versioning, but they can't be used online again. So I, I really really like the feature, and I think you know it's. Uh, it's a really cool way to kind of automatically manage features mm -hmm. uh, without going through, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, code, uh, mm -hmm. you know, code uh, committing, committing files to GitHub yeah, or, or, or you know, tagging or etc. You just put everything in the store, and the timestamp takes care of everything, and you can have those tombstone records to delete whatever you don't want to see anymore, okay? and still keep everything right? and query everything with the theme. Okay. Really good feature. Yes, that's a pretty cool feature for for versioning, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, my friends. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, the end of the demo. So it was a lot today. Um, mm -hmm. It was a lot. So uh, if you have um, questions, you have a few more minutes for your questions. And uh, so, Sego, let's wrap up. So, uh, what did we cover today? <laughs> so many Lots things. Of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blazing text, fit Amazon feature store, uh, Athena. Um, Queries, uh, and LTK, and LTK, Spacey, Spacey. <laughs> uh, Cyton, <Yeah>. Cyton, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it's uh, you know uh, it's it's pretty you know uh, it's a pretty complete example. Exactly what's happening in uh, real life. And, and, yeah, and you know you can you can just go and grab this. And let me show you the uh, most important slide. Right. It is the most important because it's the only one. <laughs> okay, screenshot time. All right, so I'll leave this one on uh, so that you can grab it. So the Amazon Reviews data set, mm -hmm. uh, the notebook or notebooks. So the, all the code that you saw is on uh, on GitLab. The SageMaker docs, so the feature store, the service docs, and the SDK docs, right? Uh, although, I have to say these are pretty simple APIs mm -hmm. and you know, reading the code should be more than enough, but mm -hmm. there are some um, options that, that you may want to look at. Uh, we have a couple of blog posts. So the, the launch blog post, if you'd like a quick recap. And um, and there's a very, very cool blog post by my, uh, my, my colleagues on uh, streaming ingestion uh, in near real time. So very, very cool one. I recommend it. 
And uh, in case you uh, you you've missed the event uh, a few weeks ago, we ran uh, AWS Innovate uh, or AI and machine learning, and uh, this had plenty of sessions, including uh, you know, feature store mm -hmm. and Clarify and data renderer oh, yeah. and and pretty much you know all the new SageMaker stuff. So uh, you can, I think the sessions are still available on demand. Uh, so just uh, go to this URL. You can register and uh, quickly and start watching all the content uh, for the event. Okay, yeah, there should be uh, should be good stuff there. Okay, uh, we're on time almost. Almost. <laughs> uh, thank you very very much. Uh, thank you for watching this. I hope you learned a lot. Um, I'm not quite sure what the next episode will be about. We'll see. Maybe SageMaker pipelines. Thank you to my colleagues who helped us organize and moderate the event. We really appreciate it. Segolian, thank you very much. Thank you for your insights. And uh, yeah, we hope you had a good time and we'll see you in two weeks. Two weeks. Right? Yeah. Until then, it's going to be Sage Maker Business <laughs> <Yeah>. as usual. <laughs> and, back on the back. <laughs> and keep rocking with machine learning. <laughs>